Thank you all. I know uh, it, it's been a long and probably um, interesting and productive afternoon. I hope we can keep this such. We can be true to our moderator, of the great Lisa Krieger, uh, who will be here, who's here in spirit and will be here in body soon. Um, and keep this interactive as possible. She really wants uh, our charges to focus on language, to focus on the kinds of things that you have concerns about, that you have concerns about when you're writing, when you're reporting, when you're being edited. Um, in talking about the cases that I'm going to talk about today, the, the recent brain death cases, uh, which if what I spent my Christmas vacation on was, was talking with reporters on these cases. Um, I, I Sometimes a reporter would say to me, I know this sounds like a stupid question, but my editor is telling me I have to ask you this question. Or there's pressure to make the story go in a certain way. Um, what do I do about that? And I even had a, had a reporter who was writing, who had written, he was writing for one of the wire services, and he wrote two stories. And one, I kind of had to grade for it and say, oh, there's some mistakes in the story. And his next one was better. And he said, I really had to advocate with my editor on what form this should take. The second story got picked up by NPR and got picked up um, by, by other uh, public radio outlets. So there is a benefit to advocating, and there's also really an ethical um, component to that as well in terms of thinking about how that story will be used and where it's going to wind up. Do you can do that device on top of the podium? Yes. Work. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do right now to just to start off the conversation is have sort of a deep dive into some of the recent coverage. We both hope, Daniel and I both hope, that this will be very interactive. So we even hold the questions to the end, but who knows, you may recognize one of your own uh, articles up here. And um, so let's let's just you know, talk about the real challenges that you face uh, in doing, as I said, bioethics on deadline. So, the, the determination of death, this was talked about a bit during the first panel. Where, when, when people talk about brain death, and when I say people, I'm usually referring to reporters or I'm talking about uh, members of the public, there can sometimes be this idea that there are no standards, that it's completely up to the grabs. But this is the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which itself is not a law, but it's a model statute. So it was written in a way that could be written into law, and indeed is law in, in most states, where, where states have law that is uh, based on it. This dates from 1980, so there was a concerted effort to provide some sort of legal standard around this issue. So these, according to the current medical, legal, and ethical standards, when death is being determined, when that clinical act is, is taking place, <coughs> It is determined either by neurological criteria, which is sometimes called brain death, or by circulatory and respiratory criteria, which is sometimes called circulatory or cardiac death. And the language of the model statute is an individual who has sustained either, not both, not one better than the other, but either irreversible cessation of circulatory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, is dead. And a determination of death must be made in accordance with medical, accepted medical standards. So this is the idea that this is the standard that you would use, and then the clinical protocols that you would use in typically your hospital or sometimes a nursing home or another setting would, would reflect the, these definitions of death. So why is this hard to explain if this has been around for at least 34 years? Well, first of all, confusion about brain states is common and difficult to under undo. Not a week goes by when I'm not report talking to a clinician, someone who's fairly familiar with this, and they refer to a patient as brain dead, and I'll say, do you mean that the patient meets the neurological criteria for a determined? And they'll say, no, and they mean that the patient has had a stroke. So it's, there is this euphemistic use of the phrase, not the phrase, it's not really like euphemism, but if there is this um, in common terminology, we use the frame brain dead to mean everything from tired to inebriated to jet lagged to have a stroke to an oxygen brain injury to dead. So these are often conflated in, in everyday speech and it can creep into media coverage as well. Brain death is conceptually confusing because of the very near and necessary presence of life-sustaining technology. The very same technology that is used to keep a living person alive is used to ventilate a body that has uh, been determined to be brain dead. 
Um, brain, brain death can be determined only in the presence of ventilator support because without the ventilator support, the body is unable to maintain its life-sustaining functions, the, the regulation of, of the heart and the breathing. And of course, um, a body that is brain dead, at least for a time, seems alive uh, because the body is warm, it has its normal color, um, it can by all uh, measures, this, this can look like a, a very similar to a person who's very ill and alive. And brain death is fairly rare. Um, there are a lot of uh, reasons that it's fairly rare, but um, part of this has to do with things like seatbelt laws and helmets and things like that. So when an objection to a determination of brain death or a delay in withdrawing mental the ventilator support actually occurs, the, and these cases leap into the media, it can make, make brain death seem more controversial than it is or seem as though there are no standards in place or result in mis misleading analogies to unlike cases because they just just don't come up as often, uh, as often as you would think. Um, when, when I talk with people, often when there's cases like this, uh, a hospital will sort of have, have a review of what do we do in cases like this. And of course, there aren't that many cases compared to the very large number of cases who are pronounced uh, uh, dead according to circulatory criteria, which would be more typical. And why is it hard to explain? Well, do objections to determination of death do not change medical facts. But journalists, members of the public, and even doctors and nurses can sometimes be unclear about the limits of consent and choice in this case. For example, to declare a death does not require that you go to get a person's consent to do this thing. That's really what you're supposed to do. Once you've determined that a patient is dead, you are supposed to make a declaration of death. And as a, a Professor Mezzel pointed out, then other things happen. Then uh, the coroner is notified. A person's property can be transferred. And there, there Various other things start to happen, but it's not a, a medical decision um, it, that, that is up to a patient or a surrogate. Some clinicians and some bioethicists have questioned the current standards, often in the context of organ donation after circulatory death, when a donor does not meet the brain death criteria. Uh, some of you, especially if you're based here in Denver, probably recall the cases from uh, 2008, which are sometimes known as the Denver cases, the cases where there was, they were a, a, a uh, babies who were born with catastrophic um, uh, 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 anomalies that were not uh, compatible with life, but some of their organs were transplantable, including the heart. And there was a question about could you pronounce someone dead according to cardiac criteria if they didn't quite meet the brain death criteria. There's an excellent series of articles that came out in the um, uh, in JAMA in uh, 2008, and there's also a special uh, uh, sort of video roundtable that a total one day um, curated that is still worth using and worth looking into to, to explain those cases. But often questions around standards occur around these organ donation cases. Sometimes there are more conceptual issues too. So somebody might object to one part of the standard, but not the entire standard. It's not the same thing as saying, I don't believe in, in brain death or I don't believe that the brain dies or something like that. So let's look at very quickly at some of the recent coverage that we saw in uh, the McNabb case. And we talked about that earlier today, so I won't go into all uh, of that, what we know about this case. So some of the features of the early and continuing coverage of the case that you began to see in, uh, in, in um, December was that ventilator was, support was referred to as what's life support, which was in, inherently confusing right there. The headlines in particular suggested that there was a battle, oh, excuse me? Sorry, we can hear that. Thanks. Um, suggested that there was a battle to keep the patient alive rather than an objection to a determination of brain death. So that could be confusing, even if the text of the article was clear, the headline was sometimes misleading. The family opinions were portrayed as legitimate prognostic possibilities, the possibility that she could recover or, or something like that. And there were emotionally charged quotes from the family and lawyer, but rather bloodless quotes from the hospital. So that, you know, it, it probably made for good copy, but it, it, it could tip how you actually read the article. There were few, if any, perspectives from bedside staff in early coverage. It's pretty rare that
that you would go and inter you would interview the family, you would interview the lawyer, but you probably aren't talking to the nurse who's actually taking care of the patient. And the nurse, who's the person who's taking care of the patient, probably is a nurse, um, is probably not able to talk to you. So you're, you know, it's a spokesperson or someone like that. And you just have to be aware that there are very good reasons for that. There might be privacy reasons um, for, the, for, the, for the clinician as, as well as for the patient and the family. Um, but it does mean that there's going to be this difference in tone, this difference in the kind of juiciness of the quote. You're at some remove from some of these perspectives. However, it is possible to talk with clinicians who have taken care of, of patients who have been determined to be brain dead, but it, it is hard to do that on deadlines sometimes. So here are just some of the, the, the headlines. You'll see the scare quotes around brain death, which makes it seem that that's kind of a dodgy, fake thing. Um, the, the idea that it's called uh, life support um, rather than ventilator support. Uh, this, this is some interesting ones on language, and you'll note these are from late December. Uh, it's Christmas Eve, there's still time for a miracle, which is in, in there right after an article about there's no legal obligation to provide medical or other intervention for a deceased person. We kind of Scrooge and Christmas quote, that, that line, you know, it's really warm there. Um, the hospital wanted to remove her from life support, but the family says she's, they believe she's still alive, so that belief story is there. The child was sitting on death row from, 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 the, from the, the lawyer. How about that one for hitting on the live wire? A facility hell bent on ending her life today and a court stepped in. So what are you meant to, meant to see? A stay of execution. Very powerful metaphor, not accurate if the patient is already dead. Also, this is not a criminal matter, but it is meant to, to stir people up. And then, of course, and this touches on some of the issues we heard about earlier today, accused the hospital of starving his niece by not using the feeding tube. You cannot starve someone who's already dead, but that, that is a very powerful um, um, metaphor and image to, to, to bring us, especially I think if the person is a child. Um, there were some other uh, headlines that came out uh, of the family claim that there was a video, although I don't think there actually was a video, or you, they, the video itself didn't surface, but this was like a report about a video. Um, at least one of the, the other two pieces were uh, commentaries. One was in a, a religious commentary, but there were things that, because everything lives on via Google, when you run searches, a lot of things come up, as, as well you know, and so it can be hard to see, okay, was this a news article? Um, is this some other kind of feature? Is this something on YouTube? Um, but those are, you know, all get, all, all get mixed in. And all of these were reported in, you know, the San Jose Mercury News, CNN, Wall Street Journal. So the byline is going to look very much like a news article. Medical misinformation crept in. The ventilator will work on a corpse. That is medically not true. Um, uh, a, a debate over the medical term brain death and whether patients can recover. And again, uh, with the scare quotes, that does make it seem as though there's something problematic about whether or not a person who is found to be brain dead, dead according to neurological criteria, can recover. And that isn't really uh, quite the terms of the debate. Um, again, language like right to life, again, touching another live wire. Um, even just a description uh, about um, the family asking for a, a trait that would make it easier for her to breathe. Again, if a person is has already died, it isn't supposed to be easier or harder to breathe. Um, again, that may have just been editing, and somebody wasn't wasn't quite clear about you know how, how that would read, but it, it can be quite misleading. Um, again, you start to see nuance. I think probably as people were reporting, they were learning from one another. So you saw um, more um, medical perspectives, articles about why brain dead means really dead, not just you know some other kind of dead. Um, you began to see more clinical perspectives, including the perspectives of bedside staff about how it can be demoralizing. And, and this is exactly what a bedside clinician would say. These are very, very emotionally difficult cases for the bedside staff. Um, and um, you know, some other clinical information that perhaps wasn't part of the first round of interviews. And then, then you started to see some ambiguity in January. Uh, the, the idea of a brain is dead but a heart beats on, which is that fundamental strangeness about brain death. The brain has died but it's difficult to say goodbye because there is a body right there, a body of a beloved person.
Um, and then sometimes you would see that there was a disconnect between the headline and the story. So the story is saying uh, treating a corpse is unethical, but the headline is still talking about life support. So um, that may have gotten to what some of the reporters were telling me about, about the disconnect between the editor and the reporter, and, and maybe it just wasn't reconciled uh, on deadline. Now another case that had come up recently, as you know, is the, the Munoz case. This was the case of the young woman who, who was pregnant. Um, some of the interesting features about this case is that it, it happened in Fort Worth, Texas in late November, but the earliest article that I could find in the Fort Worth paper was from early January, which gives you an idea that these cases often play out, as Alan Myzel said, at a clinical level for quite some time. It was only when it became a legal case, and I think that reporters were looking for other cases. So then suddenly, overlapping with the McMath case, you saw a, a big uptick in coverage. But from the very beginning, you saw ethicists uh, in the picture, which was interesting. So they probably, um, people uh, people like me, for example, had been commenting on the big math case, so the reporters already knew who to talk to. So uh, our Kaplan at NYU is talking about the situation, uh, Tom Mayo, um, uh, Jeff Spike, so these sort of very detailed accounts of what the ethics are around these cases, including cases uh, where, where uh, a patient is found to be brain dead is pregnant. So to make it clear that this is wasn't a brand new thing that had never been thought of before. Um, again, you saw some headlines, but again, it was interesting. The very first headline in the Fort Worth paper is extremely sympathetic to the family. It's about how this is a local family tied into the EMT service. There's a little box where you can raise money for them. It's, it's incredibly sympathetic to their plight. Um, still, you know, some ongoing confusion about dead and alive. This was also the Canadian case that was mentioned about a woman who was, her pregnancy was much more advanced uh, when she was uh, found to be brain dead and the baby was, uh, was viable and was delivered. Um, you did not see as much coverage of this, probably because everyone was in agreement. It just sort of got noticed because of the, the other cases. But there were, but, but again, as, as Professor Mizell mentioned, when there's agreement, um, it, it, there's much less of a conflict to write about. There was also, and this is again from Jeffrey Spike, uh, again that, that clinical perspective, there was less noise about other aspects, so they were able to point out that, that, that this, was a, this was another um, difficult situation for clinicians, which matters in these cases. So what about reporting on medically and emotionally complex topics, you know, taking it back to, to, to what you do? Um, Reporters and editors, I, I feel, have strong ethical obligations to the public and the profession that go beyond the sort of code of ethics. I, I obviously have one. But in terms of where the public is getting their information when cases like this crop up, they learn from media reports and they learn from discussions of media reports, informal grapevine sorts of conversations. So the quality of what you put in really, really matters because it's what people will, will use to talk about these things. Also, coverage of one case informs coverage of other cases, as you see in all these overlapping articles. And of how a case is remembered by the public and within healthcare institutions. When, if, if a reporter puts two cases together and says, the McNabb case is just like the Shiloh case, that almost creates a false memory. You know, that's how these cases are going to get stuck together, even though there are things that are very, very different about them. I think another thing that's very important in terms of how you approach these cases and, and your public service role is how can the, that attention-grabbing headline that makes somebody, somebody buy your paper or stay on your website, the need to get the medical and the legal facts right, and the difference between opinion as personal conviction, I believe she is alive, I don't believe in brain death, something like that, as expert consensus, this is where the law is, this is where medicine is right now, and as dissent from consensus, I disagree with that part of our consensus. How do you capture those three different ways of, of the word opinion can be uh, can be defined? That's that's pretty tough. I was talking to a reporter this morning who isn't here, but who was uh, covering. Uh, there apparently is a ceremony going on where the Shiloh family is giving a war, an award to the McMath family, and. Um, he said, you know, this is very difficult. I have to, to sometimes remember what Paul Krugman of the New York Times says, which is, you know, everyone is equal. 
people, but not every opinion has to be given the same number of column inches because some opinions have a lot more science, a lot more facts behind them than others. But it can be very difficult um, when you're covering these um, cases where there are very strong opinions and a lot of quote-worthy material. Um, another thing that I mentioned earlier is that the clinician's perspective is hard to get at, but it's important. So how would you, if you were covering not necessarily a case like this, but also some of the other cases that Alan Mizell said are the big ones coming over the horizon with utility cases, uh, cases about um, um, stopping eating and drinking but not in the context of feeding tubes, cases where feeding tubes are used inappropriately. How would you get clinical perspectives about what it's like to be in the room with a patient in this situation, with a family in this situation, even if when you're covering a breaking story, you might not be able to talk to those people. So how would you increase your knowledge of a case like this, whether you do this you know, on your own time or via a Kaiser Fellowship or maybe the lunch or something like that, those are nice. Um, so those are, those are just some thoughts about how you can prepare yourself for these kinds of cases. Now, I just wanted to say a few words, and this will segue into, into uh, what, what Dan is going to talk about as a clinician. Our neurological states that are not brain depth, but are very, very frequently confused with brain depth. One is coma, and the other is the vegetative state. It is very common in coverage of the vegetative state for headlines to say coma. Every news outlet does this. It's like a little game. You say, oh, they got it. They got it wrong again. So, but here, so, so we'll just go over this. Um, coma is the initial presentation of a severe brain injury. It could be an anoxic brain injury, the loss of oxygen. It could be a traumatic uh, uh, head injury. It could be uh, some other sort of form of injuries, of, uh, an infection or something like that. And of course, some comas are, are medically induced as well. A coma to a patient is asleep, they're unconscious, and their eyes are closed. It's a contemporary condition. That's what's really important. You can't accurately write a sentence that says the patient has been in a coma for 12 years because that patient's state, their diagnosis is not a coma. So after a few weeks, a patient would either regain consciousness or would transition to a different brain state, possibly a vegetative state. Now, the vegetative state is caused by a traumatic or an anoxic injury to the brain. There are different um, criteria for, for determining when someone is in a persistent vegetative state, a permanent vegetative state. Right now, the language is moving toward just saying vegetative state or VS sometimes, so because that, that P can get a little, a little distracting. The vegetative patient is awake but unaware. That's why their eyes are open sometimes, because they they have sleep wake cycles. Sorry, sleep wake cycles, um, because their brainstem is still functioning, and that's what regulates the, uh, the sleep. Um, they have lower brain functioning, directing the heart and the breathing, as well as uh, sleep and wake cycles, but no cognitive and higher brain functions. So we don't necessarily know what is uh, what what the, the state of brain function is in a comatose patient, but it's a temporary condition. With a vegetative uh, patient, you, uh, you, you get to a point where you can make a more definitive uh, diagnosis. It may take some months to determine this diagnosis. And this condition may be persistent or it may be permanent. We also talk about the minimally conscious state, uh, locked-in syndrome. There are a number of, of other uh, brain states that are important uh, to be clear about. In uh, the, the new edition of the Hastings Center guidelines uh, that uh, was mentioned, and there's a, a review copy of it over there and some other materials, we have a section on talking about uh, neurological states, talking about uh, these with patients and families. But it may actually be helpful to you. Uh, during the uh, McMath coverage, I actually sort of made uh, like a cheat sheet for reporters and just out of that section to say, here's what's, here's some, you know, take it to the bank kinds of definitions. Here are the, here's the way a neurologist would define these terms. But in, in plain language, so that you can write your article more, um, more quickly. So it's, it, you know, it's clear that you're, you're using the definitions that are, are the standard definitions. So you might want to take a look at the book and, and see if it's something uh, that's helpful to you as well. So